You're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussions, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Reason and Theology. Your host, Michael, on a Friday. We're back, joined by Dr. Jim Papandrea. How are you, Dr. Jim? Great to have you back on. I'm, I'm doing fine. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me back. It's great to be back. Always great to talk to you. And I, and I do want to know, for what it's worth, my books are real also. <laughs> so, um, I, I recognize. It looks like you have the Ancient Christian Commentary Series and then also see the 38-volume Early Church Series. Sure. Now, the one in the top right, the yellow one, I'm not familiar with that one. Uh, that is the Sacra Pagina. It's a oh, uh, yes, commentary yes. series on yes. the New Testament. Yeah, I don't have that one. I think you have the Nikot uh, up there. Is that right? Uh, uh, which one is that? The dark blue ones. Uh, the commentaries on old the Old Testament is that the Nikot up there? Uh, no, I, that might be the old like word biblical commentary. I, I've got yeah, a lot yeah, of yeah. still from yeah, my yeah. old Protestant <laughs> days too. You know? I was and, trying and, to figure them out and you see if I could spot so. So yeah, yeah, anyways. yeah. some of them but, are, yeah. Still, are still good, you know. Oh yeah, and and I can tell you use them too. You can you can clearly see that they're I it's do. a usable yeah. bookshelf. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, great to have you back on. You know, I really enjoyed our last discussion, and this time we're talking about the patristic era and various versions of radical traditionalism that we can find in the early church. You know, I I'm curious. Um, is this it really has struck you uh, whenever you started studying church history? Did you start to encounter some of these groups and you just thought, gosh, some, some of these people sound pretty similar to what we see today? <laughs> you know, actually, when I first started studying uh, the early church, mm -hmm. I, um, I was not Catholic. I, so I was baptized Catholic, but raised in, in a Protestant denomination. I've been in two different Protestant denominations. It was the study of the early church that brought me back to the Catholic church. Okay. So when I first started studying the early church, I really didn't know that there were factions within Catholicism, like that there was this sort of radical traditionalism within Catholicism. And so when I, when I did start hearing about these things, and of course, you know, I don't, I don't do current events. I mean, sure. anything more recent than Aquinas and Bonaventure is current <laughs> events. And so, you know, but when I finally started hearing about these things, I, you know, it, there was something about it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, you know, this is why I thought it'd be a good topic for today because, uh, you know, I've noticed you and others have been doing more and more mm -hmm. about this. And, um, you know, there seems to be more controversy and, you know, this is the thing about the, the, you know, the early church is, you know, on one hand, you know, controversy sort of forces the clarification of doctrine and things like that. But on the other hand, there's always the risk of schism and uh, schism is heartbreaking. And um, and so I worry about that. And so, you know, it's it's worth talking about. And let's also talk about, you know, what exactly is radical traditionalism? I'll, I'll take a stab at my definition and then I want to hear yours. So I would effectively define it as um, a tendency to um, go to an extreme, even to the point of dissenting against the living magisterium under the guise of tradition. Yeah. I seem to have lost you. You you froze up there. Can you hear me? Uh oh. Hmm. I don't see you. Did I lose you? One, two, three. Testing. I'm Are you here. able to hear me? Yeah, I, I can now. I lost you there for a minute. Okay. Were, you, were you able to hear me that whole time? I was able to hear you the whole time and, oh, and see you, but no, I was I able to see you anything back. Better. Yeah, that, I don't know what, what's going on. I apologize. It, it, may, it could be a connectivity issue on my, on my end here, so I apologize. Um, however, 
getting back to the definition, it, I would say it's a tendency to, under the guise of a false sense and a false understanding of tradition, to pit the living magisterium against something in the past, to insist on rupture, not, not in a good way insisting on it, but to say the living magisterium is out of step with the past, and so we have to go back to the ancient ways of doing it. Again, under a false understanding, usually, of what the past actually is, and a false understanding of what one's ascent is to the living magisterium. That's, I guess, a, how I would encapsulate it. I, I don't know if that's a good working definition. What what do you think? Yeah, no, I know. I think that sounds about right. And and I think there's two things going on here. You know, uh, in the one sense, as you say, it is an attempt to sort of pit tradition against uh, against the magisterium, against the the way the church has developed to this day. So it, so what's going on there is a is a very interesting kind of denial of the legitimacy of certain developments within the within the church so so to the extent that there may be something in the in the earlier expressions of christianity that we don't do now or that we do differently now there's a denial of development there's a denial of the legitimacy of development over time but then on the other hand the other thing that's going on here is as you say um, there is a real misunderstanding about what tradition is, yeah. what the tradition is, and and what the what the early Christians did, and so so for example, you know, the more I look at the radical traditionalists now, the more I see that their claims seem to be just a different version of the old Protestant myth. In other words, you know, the Protestant myth, and this is what I was taught, you know, coming up. The Protestant myth is that the Protestant Reformation was all about getting back to a more original version of Christianity, that the Catholics had added things and ruined it, and that therefore the Reformation was about getting back to original Christianity. This is why I started my whole YouTube channel, The Original Church. Um, and of course, that is a myth, right? And the, the Protestant Reformation did not go back to original Christianity, Um but but what I see happening in radical traditionalism is a different is, is a version of that same myth that you know we are this sort of group within the church who want to go back to a, some kind of more pristine version of Christianity before it was wrecked through illegitimate development or adding superstitions or whatever it is or you know bad popes or whatever the claim is. Um, you know underneath that is the same old Protestant myth that I think needs to be debunked. And so here, you know, here we find ourselves um, having to sort of point out a couple of really important things. And, you know, by the time we finish today, we're going to, we're going to get around to some, I think, real sort of concrete conclusions about this that I want to make sure we point out. But anyway, that's, uh, I think, mm -hmm. a good place to start. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you would say, well, it's not just limited to a comparison with the uh, Protestant Reformation. There's a lot of uh, comparisons that can be made with various groups in the early church. Is that, is that also true? Well, that's right. And so, you know, you and, and you rightly said that radical traditionalism is a form of extremism, right? Mm -hmm. And what we see in the early church are groups or factions that present extremist views on certain subjects, right? Yeah. And, you know, the, the lesson to be learned here, and so, you know, spoiler alert, this is one of the conclusions we're going to come to throughout our conversation. The lesson to be learned here is that Catholicism is, by definition, the mainstream. Yeah. It is, it is by definition, the kind of way of, of the place of balance between the extremes, and, you know, it is just an observable historical fact that when you're on one extreme, you have trouble seeing the difference between the middle and the other extreme. And so in response to one extreme, there have always been people willing to go to the other extreme. And I think that's what the radical traditionalists of today are doing. They are responding to something, but they are overcorrecting and going to the other extreme. So, so in the early church, we have these groups that that we refer to as rigorists, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, they're they're not technically radical traditionalists. They wouldn't consider themselves that because they're they're they are they were not themselves, um, you know, supposedly calling on some earlier tradition because they're already in the early church. There wasn't much 
earlier than them, but but they are what we call rigorists. They are the extremists. They are the the extra strict factions. And so um, and so we can talk about some of these today, and I can just kind of show you how you know the these rigorist factions represent an extreme. And there is an opposite extreme always, and the church always, always, always takes this kind of middle way, not the middle way as a compromise, but as the place of balance that, that refuses to go off track one way or the other. So, you know, yeah. that's what we're looking at. And we're going to look at some specific examples here in just a second. But in my observation of reading the uh, patristics and also just, you know, early, early church history and surveys on early church history, what I noticed was pretty significant changes in our penitential system. And a lot of people got hung up on that. They just found that the church is just too lax. We're not serious enough. And look, there are some legitimate criticisms here. Just as I would say, even, even the radical traditionalists today, they have some legitimate criticisms. Even back then, there were some legitimate criticisms that the church is becoming too lax. But in that extreme... You know, some people would kind of go uh, to the position of, well, you know, you just can't have any kind of post-baptismal forgiveness of sins. And it was it was just incredibly rigorous, as you said. So That's I want right. to touch touch on some of these instances. Can you tell me a little bit about Clement of Alexandria? Because he, he certainly comes to mind here. So tell us a little bit about him. Yeah, you know, Clement, Al Clement of Alexandria is that guy for whom everything you like is a sin. If you like it, it's a sin, right? He, he's that guy, and um, it, you know, especially when it when it came to sexuality, um, yeah. a, a lot of people might want to blame Saint Augustine, for example, for you know the, a church's kind of conservative stance on sexuality. But it goes way way earlier than than Augustine. Clement of Alexandria, you know, one of the things that he did that influenced the church is he um, he's responding against uh, the Gnostics of his day. And there's a certain group of Gnostics that were hedonistic. Mm -hmm. They basically, their mantra would be, you know, have all the sex you want, but whatever you do, don't have children. Don't mm. procreate because you don't want to participate in anything that the creator is doing, right? So ha have all the sex you want with everybody you want, but don't have children. And so Clement of Alexandria goes to the other extreme and he says, sex is only for procreation and nothing else. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, uh, to be fair, I mean, it took a long time for the church to find a little bit more of a middle way on that issue where we would say now today that within marriage, there are uh, legitimate um, sort of, uh, unitive and mm -hmm. uh, intimate intimacy aspects for uh, for sexuality, but um, you know within within the appropriate boundaries. But um, but anyway, so yeah, so Clement of Alexandria was maybe one of our maybe our first real rigorist in the early church um, because he was just absolutely strict. I mean, if he had his way, all Christians would be ascetics, and all Christians would be like you know like the monks who sleep on a hard floor and wear rags and no woman would ever wear makeup or braid her hair or wear jewelry or any of that. Um, so now with Clement of Alexandria, though, he never created a schism. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a rigorist, but he was not a heretic. And so we, we do have to sort of nuance the difference between, sure. between the rigorists and the heretics. Um, his, his theology was solid. Uh, so, you know, he becomes maybe, you know, historically our first example of someone who's kind of going that, that strict extreme. Yeah, but he remains in communion. However, another instance is Tertullian and he unfortunately is a different story here. Uh, so tell us a little bit about him. Yeah, well, you know, it, it's kind of progressive in the sense that with each one of these rigorists we're going to talk about, they move closer and closer to schism. Now with Tertullian, so so Tertullian, if, if people might be familiar with him, um, because he is one of the first uh, Christians to write in Latin, mm -hmm. he gave us the terms that we use in English for the Trinity. 
um, Trinitas in Latin. Not that he invented the concept, because before him, they had a Greek term for that, triados, the divine triad. Um, but he gave us the Latin terms, uh, you know, one substance, three persons. So again, on the Trinity, he's absolutely solid. In fact, he is one of the guys who helps us clarify the doctrine of the Trinity uh, for his time period. Um, but he was the he was a member of a group called the Montanists, who were um, near as we can tell charismatic. They were pacifists and they were rigorists. They were very strict. Um, you know, he's got one document where he says he says, ladies. If your veil isn't covering your whole neck, it's not big enough, right? So the veiling of women. Um, and then, you know, we're also getting into an area here where the rigorists are very concerned about um, second marriages. Mm -hmm. People who are uh, divorced or widowed and being remarried in the church. And the popes are blessing these second marriages. Now, you know, this takes a little bit of unpacking. And, and, and you know, the interesting thing about this is that this seems to be sort of the beginning of our current practice of annulment. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, so if you think about it this way, um, the rigorists are going to say, you know, marriage is for life. And once a marriage ends, for whatever reason, widowhood or divorce, no remarriage ever. That's mm -hmm. what the rigorists are going to say. Mm -hmm. Now, but remember, there's always the other extreme. We, for lack of a better term, we call them the laxists. They're mm -hmm. lax. They're, or, I mean, you could call them the, you know, the liberals of the early church if you wanted to. But uh, the, so the laxists would say, ah, you know, just show mercy on everyone, give everyone the opportunity to, to be married as many times as they want, right? Mm -hmm. so these are your extremes. And what does the sure. church do? The church finds a way to, um, emphasize the sanctity of, of, of marriage and the fact that it ought to be for life, but also to show mercy to those who find themselves unmarried again and to take their case for remarriage on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. So this is what it seems like they're doing, although we don't have a lot of the details. So the popes are allowing second marriages. And Tertullian is one of these rigorists who oppose, who like openly opposed the popes uh, for this. He also opposed the idea of a second reconciliation for the same mortal sin. So if I if I commit a mortal sin and I go confess it, right, that's it. If yeah. I do it again, no, you know, I'm excommunicated for life. Yeah. If he had his way, that's you know, right, um, you know, that's what he's proposing. Now it's it's debatable, and scholars debate over to what extent the Montanists constituted a schism. Right. Mm -hmm. The latest scholarship on this is that they were more of a charismatic renewal movement within the church, but were not quite a schismatic movement. So, you know, debatable on this. But again, with each one of these rigorists we're, we're looking at, they go they move more and more towards schism. And one of the things that I'm going to say is rigorism always eventually leads to schism. And this is yeah. one of the reasons why it's such a huge problem. Yeah. And, and Tertullian eventually joins the, the Montanists. And, you know, as you said, there, there's some concerns here about their unity with the church, but yeah, it was a pretty, right. pretty radical and extreme group. And it's a, somewhat of a sad moment because Tertullian had a lot to offer as an ecclesiastical writer, but then he, you know, adopts right. the, Right. Well, it, like I say, you know, these these rigorists tend to be absolutely solid and orthodox on the Trinity, on Trinitarian doctrine. And in yeah. fact, it is the rigorists who really help the church clarify the doctrine of the Trinity. And yet on these other matters, mm -hmm. um, they they go to the extreme. And, and what we're going to see as we sort it out is that on, on certain doctrinal matters like the Trinity, these rigorists are, are absolutely solid and orthodox. But where they drift into heresy is in their sacramental theology, mm. right? And so it, it becomes a matter of how they view the sacraments and how they view the church, their ecclesiology. So, yeah. Yeah. Which is very similar to... 
radical traditionalist tendencies today, because as I've pointed out with radical traditionalism today, at the heart of it is a deficient ecclesiology. That's and, really what and, it And you're out. absolutely right. That yeah. and sacramental theology. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about Hippolytus. Was he, I, I know he died in communion with the church, uh, but I think at one point he was out of communion. Is that correct? Well, that also is a matter of debate among scholars. And, and you know, adding to the, the confusion is uh, there's debate among scholars over the, the documents written by Hippolytus mm -hmm. and whether they're all written by the same person. Right. Mm -hmm. Some scholars actually propose that there's more than one person with the name Hippolytus. Sure. But uh, if people are familiar with with the um, the document, um, the apostolic tradition, mm -hmm. it's usually uh, attributed to Hippolytus. But even that has layers of material that were added later. So it becomes a little bit different, difficult to sort it out. Um, so when you read the documents of Hippolytus, he, he definitely uh, opposes the popes. He openly criticizes the popes. He calls them stupid. He calls them idiots. He, uh, <laughs> so he, you know, he has no problem uh, opposing them. It may be that he is, and according to tradition, he's supposed to be the bishop of some place called Pontus, but we have no idea where this is. Theoretically, it would be in, in, the, in the area close enough to Rome that he would be sort of a part of the, if you will, archdiocese of Rome, right? And so he he seems to be opposing, in general, the the authority of the Pope or perhaps any metropolitan to sort of override his own excommunications. And so what's what's going on here is that Hippolytus claims for himself the role of bishop, apparently, mm -hmm. and he claims to be able to excommunicate people. So either he's doing that because he sees himself as a bishop, or perhaps he is a bishop, or he's doing that because he thinks he has that authority as the priest as a, of a parish. But whatever that situation is, the people he's excommunicating are going to Rome and to the popes, and they're being reconciled. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's upset about. What are the issues here? Again, uh, remarriage, second and third marriages. And get this, Hippolytus is upset because the popes are um, blessing second and third marriages for priests. Mm -hmm. And they're allowing priests who get married while they're a priest to, to remain as priests. So notice, even the rigorist here is not arguing for a celibate clergy. He's mm -hmm. arguing for um, the, the fact that clergy should not be allowed to be remarried, right? The, the, the uh, the celibate clergy actually develops, you know, a little bit later in the fourth century, and I've got a video on that where I make it clear that this is a good and legitimate development. Sure. Um, right. So this is one of those cases where you can't just say, you know, automatically everything the earliest Christians did is exactly what we should be doing. But you know, it seems like what Hippolytus is arguing for is something very much like what our Eastern brothers and sisters do, where they're mm -hmm. they're priests. If they're married when they become priests, they remain married. But then if that marriage ends, they would not get remarried. Right. And if they are single when they become a priest, they would not get married. So right. that seems to be what Hippolytus is advocating for. Um, so at any rate, though, but again, notice the popes are taking this more middle road where, you know, they're, they're not saying let everybody get married as much as they want, but they're also not taking this strict um the, the strictest way and they're you know they're they're finding a way to show mercy uh on a case by case basis um and so and so hippolytus is openly criticizing the popes on on this issue here's here's what's interesting you know how i mentioned earlier with radical traditionalists there's a false sense of tradition I remember with the, what was it? The, was it the Amazonian Synod? Uh, there was a major panic that um, maybe priests in the Roman Rite in the Amazon would be, uh, or individuals would be allowed to marry and married men could then be ordained to the priesthood. All right. Um, so then you would have married clergy who are at least priests in the Roman Rite. And this was seen by some as just heresy. This is just and again, we're not debating the question of whether or not priestly celibacy is the ideal. It certainly is. Um, but some people thought, okay, well, you know, having married clergy in the Roman, right? That's just heresy. 
And here it's very clear in the Roman tradition, you do have, however, a history of married clergy. And so one certainly cannot anathematize it as heresy. Yeah. Again, one could argue that maybe that's not the ideal. Perhaps it's ideal to have priestly celibacy. Of course it is, according to St. Paul. Um, but you could have something that's less than ideal that's still good. But here again is an instance of a false notion of tradition that I just see over and over and over with radical yeah. traditionalists. Well, don't we already have married priests? I mean, you know, when I when I came into the Catholic Church, this is over 20 years ago now, but when I came back into the Catholic Church, uh, my priest at the time said, you know, if you want, because I was ordained in a Protestant denomination, um, I could have apparently transferred my credentials and been in and been clergy uh, in the Catholic Church, although I chose not to pursue that because uh, I had discerned that that wasn't my calling, and so that you know, mm -hmm. wasn't wasn't a thing for me. But but don't we already have some? Well, certainly Eastern Catholics, but also within the Roman Rite, there are yeah. some Roman Rite married priests already. For instance, in the Anglican Ordinariate. So yeah. again, it's it's a naivete, it's an ignorance, and it's a again a, a misplacement of what is sacred tradition a misidentification of what is sacred tradition and so there's yeah. that zeal of no we have to stick to the past we have to do the things in the ancient way when there's an ignorance of what exactly is the ancient way yeah yeah well the other thing that people have to keep in mind with regard to marriage too is that in the roman world legal marriage was really only for people with a lot of money mm -hmm. and so um so one of the things the church had to do pretty early on is make a distinction between civil marriage or registered marriage, according to the Romans, um, which was easily entered into and very easily broken and easily re-entered, et cetera, make a distinction between that and holy matrimony, what would be, you know, in the early church, a blessed union. And so, you, you know, you've got this whole messy world in the early church of people who are not legally married because they can't be according to Roman law, because they're from different social classes or whatever, uh, but who are married according to the church because their union was blessed by their bishop. And so um, it's, it's messy. It really is. But, um, but, you know, Hippolytus is just another example of someone who uh, wanted to go the very strictest way possible, which would, I assume, you know, leave people out of the church, either through excommunication or through them not wanting to join in the first place. And the, and the popes chose a, um, you know, a, a more balanced approach. Um, and then, but then what you have is you have Hippolytus treating his followers as a separate school. He uses the word school. So it's not quite clear. Is this a schism yet? Is it on the verge of a schism or is is Hippolytus just the leader of the Greek-speaking Christians in the area as opposed to the Latin-speaking Christians? This is another whole problem um, because Hippolytus is still using Greek, whereas the rest of the church in the, in the West is transitioning to Latin. So it's not clear just how far he goes into schism, but he goes farther than Tertullian, I think. So in other mm -hmm. words, you see, again, this progression Clement of Alexandria, not schismatic at all. Um, Tertullian, factional group within the church. Hippolytus now, um, thinking of, of his group as a separate school from the school of, of, of Zephyrinus and Callistus, the, the popes at the time, right? And then when we get to the next one, schism. Yeah, the next one being the Novationists. Yeah, right, so right. yeah, we we do experience a schism here. Tell me a little bit about the Novation schism. What was it really about? Well, this was all about, and this is this all comes out of the aftermath of um, what were at the time the the worst persecutions the church had ever faced. This is the third century now, right? The two hundreds, mm -hmm. and um, and the you know the basic issue is. The government is telling you you have to prove your patriotism, your loyalty to the emperor, by making a pagan sacrifice, right? And if you don't, you can be executed or tortured or your property and business will be confiscated, or whatever they want to do to you. What do you do with the people who give in to that, who make the pagan sacrifice to save their life or their livelihood, 
who deny the faith as a requirement as part of that that pledge of loyalty and then show up for church on Sunday for mass what do you do with these people right and and again you know there's the there's the laxist party who wants to say oh just let them back in no consequences for what they've done problem with that is everybody knows someone or has a loved one who didn't deny the faith and who was executed for it hmm. so why did my loved ones die for the faith as martyrs if you guys can just waltz back in here and come to mass right mm -hmm. so so the laxists are saying ah let them back in the rigorists go to the other extreme and they say no excommunication for life and you know maybe on your deathbed we'll reconcile you if you're sorry enough but you know that's the rigorous position and again as always the mainstream church takes this sort of place of balance in the middle way right not the extreme that says no consequences but not the other extreme the rigorous extreme that says extreme consequences Mm. It's this place of balance where there's consequences, but also uh, reconciliation. So what does that mean? It means it means reconciliation with penance. And mm -hmm. this is the moment in history when our sacrament of confession, penance, and reconciliation really becomes standardized and formalized throughout the church, right? This So the persecution forces the standardization of of our sacrament of, of uh, reconciliation. So that's what's going on here. But Novation became the head of a group who, uh, who split off. Now, again, Novation is absolutely solid and orthodox on the Trinity. Before the schism, he wrote a document on the Trinity that literally helped define the doctrine of the Trinity for the third century and, and put all the building blocks in place for the, for the uh, Nicene Creed right but then you know it, the 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 controversy gets worse and worse and worse until a bunch of uh you know schismatic bishops pull him aside and consecrate him as the bishop of rome when he's not and that he was not legitimately elected and so we get our first real sort of they call it an anti-pope you know someone who claims to be the bishop of rome but who isn't when there's actually a different Bishop of Rome. And, and actually, there was an election. Uh, and he, I mean, to put it in modern terms, he he ran for the election of, of Pope on the platform of, I'm just going to excommunicate everybody who who lapsed in their faith during the persecution. Well, he, he wasn't elected, right? Cornelius becomes the next Pope, because Cornelius is, is, is able to find this middle way between the laxists and the rigorists. And so, so yeah, so novation is really the first like real schism of the church where you can put, uh, and I'm not talking about heresies. There have been heresies before, but I mean the first real sort of schism where you can put a name on it. We call them no novationists. They call themselves purists. Mm. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think arguably you, you could make the case that the novationists were the first attempt at Protestantism. Um, they were the first attempt at sort of being Christian but not Catholic. Uh, and interestingly enough, the Council of Nicaea validated them in that claim, right? Because the Council of Nicaea basically said they're Orthodox dogmatically, and if they want to come back into the Catholic Church, they are welcome to, and even their priests can retain their faculties in the in the uh, in the catholic church so it was a, just a very interesting situation where we have these we have this schism now first time in history where you can say uh you know doctrinally christian in terms of the doctrine of the trinity but in terms of ecclesiology and their sacramental theology you know outside outside the uh the boundaries that that's really interesting especially with sacramental issues because that brings us to the donatists the next group who really mm -hmm. struggle with this issue and i want to say before we explain you know what donatism is i honestly believe if you could take a lot of the radical traditionalists today transport them back into the era of the donatists they would have been donatists schismatics and heretics they would have they would have gone straight for it because one of the things that we see today in radical traditionalism 
is a very rigorous view of outside the church there is no salvation now it's certainly true outside the church there is no salvation that's a dogma but what i mean here is an overly rigorous and false understanding of what that means yeah right. and likewise the donatists struggled with this to the extreme that it overflowed into their sacramentology so can, can you tell us a little bit about their perspective yeah, well, you know, the Donatists come up in the uh, you know fourth and fifth century, and they're they're sort of famous for um, being in a controversy with Saint Augustine because he was in North Africa. Donatism was primarily a North African phenomenon, but they basically took what what the Novatians did with the sacrament of of reconciliation, the Donatists did with the sacrament of holy orders, and so they sort of you know just turn it up a notch. And and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I would say. For both the Novationists and the Donatists, they are the the radical traditionalists of the early church, um, and especially with the Donatists, because what they do then is they take it to the extreme of saying, "Okay, now I can point to clergy who are not legitimate because right," and then they have their reasons, um, and they start they start parsing out who who the legitimate clergy are. And you know, this there's a really interesting phenomenon that takes place at, at this time, because if you were to ask, if you were to ask, uh, you know, in the earliest centuries of the church, what you know, what what are the worst sins you can commit? What are the mortal sins? They, you know, the first answer would be uh, any sin that breaks one of the Ten Commandments, right? Mm -hmm. Take it a little farther down the road, and and you ask, you know, uh, what what are the worst sins you can commit? And and three sort of rise to the top: apostasy. Mm -hmm. adultery and murder in that order right but as all of this shakes out very quickly the church fathers come to the consensus that the worst mortal sin you can commit is to create a schism mm. and and i think that it would be it would be good for us to reiterate this kind of thinking i don't mean i don't know if you know it's true dogmatically speaking but you you know what i'm saying that that sure. the the seriousness of the um of the sin of creating division and and controversy and schism um you know we uh we, we i think we need to sort of reemphasize just how serious that is yeah that that's certainly a helpful ob observation and 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 when it comes to the Donatists, they're effectively saying there's no sacraments outside of the formal bounds of the church because they're taking the position of outside the church, there is no salvation to an extreme. They're saying, look, if outside the church, there is no salvation, how can you have valid sacraments outside the church? How can you say that this non-Catholic baptism is a valid baptism and that the Holy Spirit is given at the hands of a non-Catholic minister? They yeah. they take it to an extreme again, very very similar to how some things are today. Now, I mean, today you'll see radical traditionalists recognize painfully, they'll painfully recognize that yeah, fine, reluctantly, yeah, okay, their sacraments may be valid, but it's like they 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 struggle with that because they lean towards a very rigorous view of outside the church there is no salvation so yeah yeah, yeah. Well, that's right i mean because what they're doing is they're defining the church differently right mm -hmm. your point i mean it becomes a question of ecclesiology the the reason why the early church fathers said outside the church there is no salvation is because outside the church there are no sacraments mm -hmm. right it's the sacraments it, it's not it's not the other way around it's that it, because there are no valid sacraments outside the church, that's why you won't find salvation there. But again, it, it, it's a, it becomes a question of well, then how do you define the boundaries of the church? Mm -hmm. And and so this is this is sort of the essence of Augustine's beef with the Donatists, because Augustine is saying, and the mainstream church is saying, the church is a hospital for for people who have the disease of sin. And the sacraments are its medicine, right? But the Donatists are defining the church as like a quarantine for the healthy people, right? Keep the sick people out and only let the healthy people in. And then you get into this whole realm. And, and you know, you could also make the case that, that the Donatists are the first fundamentalists. Mm. Because then you get into this whole realm of 
the idea of protecting the sacraments from people, right? Um, I mean, you know, in the Catholic world, we have reasons for reserving the Eucharist, you know, within the Catholic Church. But if you go into the Protestant world, there are Protestant denominations where they will not give their communion to anyone outside of their own congregation even. And the reason given for that is because they are protecting the table from the unknown. It, you know, <laughs> the sacraments do not need our protection, right? At least not as lay people, but anyway, you get the idea. So, um, so, so it really is a matter of ecclesiology. The church is not, you know, a, uh, a, a some kind of gated community for the, uh, you know, for the elite. It's not a quarantine for the healthy. It, it's not an all-inclusive resort for the people who have made it. The church is a hospital for the people who need the medicine of the sacraments. And that's the way, you know, that's why we have to think of it. Can you comment on Cyprian? I mean, St. Cyprian, it seems that he really struggled with kind of Donatism before there was Donatism, which is he struggled with the validity of sacraments outside of the visible bounds of the church to the point that he was willing to fight against the Pope at the time, St. Stephen. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Right. Care to well, comment on that? Sure. I mean, I don't know whether I would call Cyprian a rigorist or not, um, but he 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 was embroiled in a controversy with the Pope, who was Saint Stephen at the time. And this is this is right around the same time as Novation. Cyprian and Novation are, are contemporaries. Um, but after that after that persecution, um, you know the the question comes up, and this is you know part of the big question with the Donatists too. You know the question comes up. Well, you know what if you find out that you were baptized by someone who had made a pagan sacrifice to save his life during the during the persecution. What if you found out that that there's some serious flaw in the faith of the person who presided over some sacrament for you? And the question becomes: Is does that somehow invalidate the sacrament? Mm -hmm. And now the good news is that the church you know, came to the conclusion and still teaches that no, it does not invalidate your sacrament, which is, which is good news for everybody. Because for whatever reason, if you found out that the, the priest who baptized you or married you or confirmed you, if you found out later that that person was a terrible guy, for some reason, mm -hmm. your baptism, your, your confirmation, your sacraments are still valid. So no one should worry about that. The validity, the validity of the sacraments does not depend on the morality of the presider. So mm -hmm. that's, but at the time, there were some in North Africa who were experience, who were experimenting with the idea of rebaptism. In other words, um, when someone comes to us for confession and we reconcile them, should we rebaptize them? Was their sin so bad that they need to be rebaptized? And so there have there were a couple over uh, over time in North Africa. Who experimented with the idea of rebaptism, and but the Pope and the Church declared no, baptism is not to be done again. You don't rebaptize. So for a while, Cyprian was arguing with Saint Stephen about this. Cyprian wanted to rebaptize, um, and, and you know, to be fair, I mean, it's a it's a messy question because what if the person was baptized by the Novationists outside, mm -hmm. of, you know, in a schism? Well, then what do you do? So. Um, but, but the bottom line is we do not rebaptize. And, you know, I have a whole video on this and this is one of my, my real pet peeves, soapboxes, whatever you want to call it, because there are Protestant denominations and Protestant congregations to this day that practice rebaptism. And I think that is one of the worst blasphemies you can commit. I think it's one of the worst heresies you can be involved in. I think it's one of one of the worst acts of schism anyone can do as a pastor is to rebaptize someone who has legitimately been baptized. So, you know, don't get me started. Interestingly enough, some of the Eastern Orthodox uh, rebaptize, and and it's due to a false understanding of the sacraments and a very rigorous yeah. view. Not all Eastern Orthodox do that. But there are Orthodox who will rebaptize Catholics who are received into Eastern Orthodoxy, for instance. Yeah, that's an act of schism. 
Yeah. That, that is an act of schism. Now, we do provisional baptisms. Like sometimes there are cases where a person really doesn't know whether they were baptized or not. And we have a, a right for that. But um, but that's not a rebaptism. So, yeah. So, I mean, that was the issue with Cyprian. Um, but again, you know, these 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 church fathers, um, you know, they 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 skew off to an extreme in some of their sacramental theology and some of their ecclesiology. Um, but even with the Donatists, I, I don't think there's any evidence that the Donatists were were doctrinally heretical in terms of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, but 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 certainly with the Novationists and the Donatists, you have like full on schism. And, um, you know, this is this is always the danger of of rigorism. Tell me a little bit about the moniker radical traditionalism. Do you think that that's really apropos, given that they're not very traditional? <laughs> well, I mean, I think that's kind of the point, right? I mean, in the sense that the the traditional part is a misnomer. Um, it's it's not radical traditionalism, right? Um, it's a form of rigorism. But it, but if today's radical traditionalists really wanted to be radically traditional, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they would insist on having their liturgy in Greek. <laughs> right. You know, they would they would cross themselves on their forehead. Right. <laughs> they would make all the women cover their heads and neck and face completely with a veil. Um, and not only that, they would receive the Eucharist standing up and yeah. in their hand. Right, right. <laughs> the early Christians did not receive the Eucharist kneeling or on the tongue. And so when 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 someone who says, oh, you know, the only proper way to receive the Eucharist is, you know, on your knees or on your tongue, by saying that, that is that is going back to a tradition, but only a certain distance back, only a thousand yeah. years back or whatever, not all the way back. So so, you know, this is going back to a tradition that's actually more medieval than early Christian. Um, so, uh, you know, so it's it's not radical traditional, traditionalism. It's selective traditionalism or pseudo-traditionalism. Um, and so I think that, uh, well, you know, maybe we should stop calling them radical traditionalists. Maybe we should call them pseudo-trads or, or semi-trads or something. And, and you know, <laughs> Again, these are our brothers and sisters in Christ. So, uh, you know, I get that. Um, but some of them are leading people astray. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and like I said, you know, rigorism always leads to schism eventually. So, you know, and, and the, the Catholic, the, the Catholic tradition is by definition the, you know, the mainstream. It's that it's that place of balance between the extremes, not the fringes, you know. I, I could only imagine a radical traditionalist being transported to the second century to a church where they're receiving communion on the hand from a married priest in a liturgy that's done in Greek. I think they, they would be very confused. Right. They would look at their time machine and go, wait, I didn't go back far enough? What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah just... well, and that's the thing. I mean, it seems to me that again, in and I'm you know, I, I, I'm not, I've never been in this camp, so I can't speak to this from personal experience, but it seems to me that when someone says radical traditionalist, what they really mean is radical pre-Vatican twoist. Yeah. <laughs> or radical tridentinist or that, something like that. That is a very, very helpful observation because it's it's certainly not necessarily tradition that they're appealing to. Uh, but that's why I always find it ironic because what people will do is they'll say, you know, in the post-conciliar era, you have this and that liturgical innovation. And I'm thinking, wait, actually that is restoring something to how it used to be. The innovator is the pre-conciliar TLM crowd that's where you have some innovations and so what you have in the post-conciliar era in some cases is a, a change certainly but it's a change back to how things traditionally were so while while you, you tend to hear the post-conciliar church being you know accused of innovation it's it's actually the accusers who are the ones who are the innovators in many of these yeah things. yeah right and but it also gets down to the question of nuance right so it it's never an all or nothing proposition right um it, the word innovation 
is kind of like sort of morally neutral. In other words, you know, if you use that word, then you have to use it as you are with the understanding that some innovations are valid and good and others are not. You know, with my students, I tend to try and stick with terms like development versus evolution. So developments are good, but evolution sort of implies a change from one thing to into another. So an evolution would be an, an illegitimate innovation, whereas a development would be a legitimate innovation. So, the, you know, again, the development of a celibate clergy in the West is a good and wise and reasonable development. Um I think, you know, there's a question here from Dustin. He asks, how would this early church have viewed or how would the early church have viewed and dealt with the traditionalist recognize and resist philosophy when it comes to the Holy Father? Hmm. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the question is. I mean, the, the church fathers have different approaches to philosophy. But um, mm -hmm. you know, effectively, from... what he's asking is today there's a group that are called recognize and resist. They say we recognize the pope is the pope, but we resist his authority on liturgical matters, on some of his teachings. We mm -hmm. resist him because he's at odds with tradition. So wow. anytime wow. he conflicts with tradition, resist. Well, but again, you know, who is the authority that you are listening to then to tell you what the tradition is or should be, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm i always annoyed by all of the amateurs on YouTube. And, and like, you know, I love being on this show because you, you know your stuff and you and I are on the same page. Um, but there's a lot of people out there who claim to know what they're talking about who, you know, have no training, no education in this, you know, they're just out there. Um, so if someone says, I resist the authority of the Pope on issue X, Y, Z. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, to be fair, if, if I had to come up with a list of, you know, it, complete the sentence, I wish the Pope would, or I wish the Pope wouldn't, right. I could come up with that list. Sure. But the, it's a question of authority and, you know, to be Catholic, to be a member of any religion, I would imagine it has something to do with submitting yourself to something greater than yourself mm -hmm. and not making yourself your own highest authority. Sure. So if, if someone says to me, I resist the Pope's authority on this issue, I want to say, okay, well then what authority do you accept and how do you discern that choice? Right. That's the question I would want to ask. And until I get a good answer for that question, sure. I'm going to submit myself to the church. They're they're gonna say I submit to the magisterium of the past. Pope Pius the twelfth said this, and Pope Pius the fifth said that. And so, what they'll do is they'll start appealing to magisterial documents from the past, and they'll say, "See, the current pope is at odds with this previous pope. Therefore, I'm gonna go with the previous pope." What would you say to? Well, that? sure, but see again, yeah. So so again, that is just playing the Protestant game under the Catholic umbrella. Because yeah. then my question would be, okay, how do you discern where to draw the line, right? So popes up until what date will you accept, mm -hmm. right? What's, what's your cutoff? Mm -hmm. And how did you choose that cutoff, right? So, so this would be my question. And mm -hmm. it's always going to come down to because I'm more comfortable with what they said before that date or whatever mm -hmm. the date is, mm -hmm. you, know? Um, same, you know, same thing with, you know, with in the in the Protestant world, you know, like the whole Protestant project is, is and and again, don't don't get me wrong. These are our brothers and sisters in Christ. I teach at a Protestant school. I get it. But the whole Protestant project is based on the assumption that at some point the church went off the rails. So the question is, when do you think that happened? Right. Mm -hmm. And and by what authority do you make that determination? And that's you know, these are the questions we would have to ask. John asks, how do you see or do you see uh, apocalyptic ecclesiology bound up with radical traditionalism, the idea being to preserve the church from some imminent and ongoing end times apostasy? Sound familiar today? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, you know, I would never say that the devil cannot infiltrate the church. Right. Of course. Um, it's like, uh, you know, Judas. And I, and I, I wouldn't say that that popes you know, the, the infallibility of the office of the papacy, 
does not mean that individual popes are right about everything. You know, it's like, you know, what Alexander the sixth said when he heard uh, that he had been elected pope, he said, I can't wait to go home and tell my wife. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so not all popes are perfect. <laughs> um, but, but do you uh, notice a connection and a tying with the end times are now it's imminent, you know, have you noticed a connection there with radical traditionalists? I think so. I think so. But again, I don't, I don't follow the radical traditionalists to know oh, it's, what they're saying, but I will, I will tell you this from my own experience. Sure. Just the other day I was, you know, lamenting the direction culture and society are going. Mm -hmm. And I can give you my whole list. And I was saying to myself, surely we are in the end times. And then I opened up and I happened to be reading one of St. Cyprian's treatises. And I opened up Cyprian, third century. Guess what he said? Surely we are in the end times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's all I Well, guess. technically, we've been in the end times since the book of Acts, according to the author of Sacred Scripture. And, and we yeah, should no, be like in the end times, whether we are or not. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I totally get you. And, but yeah, they're they're... I'm noticing a lot of the radical traditionalists have their hair on fire right now, really, really going towards we're in the end times, the times of the antichrist is nigh. And, you know, it's yeah, just, well, you know, look, if they're right, right, maybe they're right. But if so, so speaking to the radical traditionalists now, if you guys are right, then stop creating division, right? Mm -hmm. Stop trying to shoot the man in the foxhole next to you. And and aim at take aim at our common enemies, right? Stop creating division. Create unity within the church. Well, what We're gets common. what gets even more complex is they believe that the office of the papacy um, has been taken over by the enemy, and so they actually believe that you know the enemy of the church is now take has now taken over Rome, and they'll cite. Um, certain misunderstandings of prophetic literature. They'll sure. say Rome has lost, will lose the faith to become the seat of the Antichrist, not realizing that that wasn't approved by Rome. That was actually put on the index of forbidden books. And so, but they'll yeah. constantly cite that as loss of lead yeah. and say, see, Rome's going to lose the faith. It's going to become the seat of the Antichrist. And that's now. And so we have to depart from the institutional church and so on. Yeah, well, I would say to that, I would say this to that. I would say, look, you know, this is again the same problem that the Protestants have. If you think the Pope is the Antichrist, right, then when do you think Jesus stopped keeping his promise that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church? Like when when did Jesus stop keeping that promise? Mm -hmm. And the other thing I would say is, you know, if you think the Pope is the Antichrist, well, congratulations, you have just become a Lutheran, right? Yeah. And so you know, again. I'm not saying this pope is perfect. I could come up with a list of things that annoy me about this pope too, but I love him because my whole, he's my holy father. And if you think you're more Catholic than the pope, that doesn't make you more Catholic. It just makes you a new kind of Protestant. Mm -hmm. so, there's, there's another one here for you. Uh, what is the most fun, rigorous demand that we should start asking uh, that Ratchrads should hold to be truly traditional? Yeah. Any uh, any ideas here? Um, I would say let's let's ask them to to make all of their women wear you know complete head veil, <laughs> head and neck. And I would say that let's also ask them to pray standing in the cruciform position. You can't see, it, but my arms are holding yeah, straight. Yeah. Up. Pray in the cruciform position, standing. Oh, and by the way, whether you you know think that the kneeling thing in mass is a development or not, one thing is for sure: you don't get to sit down. Yeah. At all during that. So and another and another thing is no kneeling on Sundays per the council no of Nicaea. Sunday. Nicaea exactly. one says no uh, yeah. kneeling on Sundays. That's exactly right. The the kneeling thing, I got a video on that too. The kneeling thing is for when you are not receiving communion that day. Yeah. Right. Uh so so you'd be standing for mass, um, no sitting, you'd uh, you know, you would uh <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's again, it's, it, it, the trad part is a misnomer. That's I the problem. With you. I agree. Thank you so much for coming on and doing this. We're at an hour. Go ahead and put in a plug for anything you want to make our viewers aware of. 
uh, just come out and check my check out my YouTube channel, The Original Church. And um, if you like that enough, we have a locals community, The Original Church Community on Locals, where I'm teaching a Bible study every week. And uh, we're having regular meetings to talk about prayer and devotion and spiritual life and popular culture and all kinds of stuff. So all the interaction I do with folks is on my locals community on locals.com, the original church. So uh, yeah, come and see me. Thank you so much again for coming on. Truly an honor. Love to have you back on again. Yeah, let's do it. Everybody hit that like button and the subscribe button. Thank you so much for watching and also check me out patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support what I'm doing here. We'll see you later. God bless. If you're looking to buy or sell a home, office, or any kind of property anywhere in the world, you're going to want to call Real Estate for Life, and they're going to connect you with a Catholic agent. Now, that agent will donate a portion of their commission upon sale, and Real Estate for Life will donate 75% of that gift to a pro-life organization at no cost to you. Call Real Estate for Life at 1-877-LIFE-US1 or text them 205-926-1111.